Hello and welcome to the program. I am Deji Badimasi. Now, following the removal of petrol subsidy, President Bola Tinubu had said his government was working on palliatives to ease the burden of the subsidy removal on citizens. Well, action is now being taken to bring about the palliatives. Both the Senate and House of Representatives have approved the President's request to extract 500 billion naira now from the 2022 budget to provide the much awaited palliatives. The 500 billion naira will be taken from the 819 billion naira supplementary appropriation bill act, I should say. Now, uh, as you can imagine, uh, no detail, of course, has been provided on the palliative. So for now, we do not know what the nature of uh, the palliative would be. Besides, labor unions in the country have continued to insist that the best palliative they want is a 300 percent increment in the national minimum wage. In a related development, President Tinubu has also asked the Senate to allow his administration process the $800 million loan facility from the World Bank requested by uh, the government of uh, President Mohamed Buhari. That's the government now he succeeded. According to President Tinubu, the sum of 8,000 naira uh, a month now will be given to 12 million poor and low-income households for a period of six months with a multiplier effect on about 60 million individuals. In letters sent to both chambers, the president said in order to guarantee the credibility and transparency of the process, digital transfers will be made directly to beneficiaries' accounts and mobile wallets. According to him, it's expected that the program will stimulate economic activities in the informal sector and improve nutrition, health, and education outcomes for beneficial households. Joining me now to discuss all of this in uh, greater detail is Dr. Muda Yusuf, who is the CEO of the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. Uh, Dr. Yusuf, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Uh, let's start from what uh, the president says. Uh, this it, We'll start from the $800 million facility now. Uh, the president says uh, the 8,000 naira that will be uh, distributed to uh, this household now 12 million households now would help to stimulate the economy. And the question uh, many would ask is, um, well, could, could that happen? Could, could 8,000 Naira actually make a difference in, in this economy? Well, uh, first, let us uh, appreciate the fact that at least the president is taking an action in response to the plight of the citizens. Uh, amidst the challenges imposed by the first subsidy removal and other economic reforms. But, uh, you know, uh, having regard to our experience with cash transfers, the whole principle of cash transfers has not proved to be an effective way of mitigating uh, poverty issues in Nigeria. Uh, we had an experience with the former regime uh, under the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management. Uh, they had a social register of about maybe 12 million people and so on. And they said they did quite a number of, uh, of cash transfers. Uh, up to today, uh, it is difficult to assess the impact of that. Because generally in this economy, we have a major challenge with the quality of data. Uh, and cash transfers are typically very vulnerable uh, to corruption, to abuse. And at the end of the day, the chances that will achieve the, the appropriate or the desired outcomes is very, very minimal, it's very low. So personally, I'm not so excited about all this whole idea of cash transfers uh, based on the principle itself. Then additionally, there is also the issue of the, even the amount. We are talking about 8,000 Naira for household over six months. I mean, we are dealing with an economy where we have 133 million uh, people in multidimensional poverty. So my view is that we should be looking at something much more fundamental, much more inclusive, much more comprehensive. You said we should be looking at something much more comprehensive and much more pivotal. And I'm saying, what, what do you think that should be? No, we know the current pace of the citizens 
First, there is a very serious issue with the cost of food. Let us look at the variables driving the food inflation. If we need to engage those in the agri and the food sector and value chain, the government should do that. So that we can see what we can do internally, either through trade, through taxes, through tariffs, to bring down the cost of food. Then there's a major issue with transportation. What can we do to bring down the cost of transportation? Are we going to liberalize imports and reduce import duty on buses, mass transit buses and all of that? So that both the federal, the state and local government, uh, local government uh, areas and of course even the commercial vehicle operators can have access to cheaper buses so that they can buy more buses, even companies, so that you have more of these buses so that you know, the pressure on the cost of transportation will be reduced. We have a challenge with the cost of energy. Only recently, there was an imposition of 7.5% uh, VAT on diesel at a time like this. So if you look at all the costs around the cost of energy, the variables around the cost of energy, there are quite a number of them that you can knock off. You know, so it, it should be a combination of policies and actions. Some of it in form of taxation, some of it in form of tariff policies, some of it in form of trade policies. So that you can have something that will have a macro effect, an economy-wide effect across everybody. Those, that way we, we, we can, I think we can get a lot more mileage and a lot more impact. And, and because you this talked about, idea of because you talked about food is not, is and you know, the, the high cost of food, food inflation of course, at over 22 or over 23 uh, percent as we speak. Uh, just uh, recently, the president declared an emergency on uh, food, food security. W what, what difference do you think that would make, you know, given the scenario we're looking at at the moment, especially in the face of this uh, subsidy removal? Well, uh, the, I like the whole idea of situating the issue of food within the the scope of an emergency. So that gives us a much larger latitude to take some extra ordinary actions. But the whole idea of releasing grains and fertilizer, I don't think that will, that will achieve much. We should have an engagement with those in the food sector. For instance, look at, look at the cost of bread. If you talk to those in the value chain, they will tell you that some of the import tariff on wheat you have a wheat levy, you have an import duty on wheat, which the flour millers are paying for. Look at the cost of sugar. So what can we do, what policies can we think out with to reduce the, the, those import duties? Those are within our control. You know, the same thing with sugar, so that the price of bread can come down. Now, in the case of rice, look at all the, all, all the rice mills that we have. In Lagos, we have one of the biggest, actually the biggest, Rice mills in, in, the, in the country, if not in Africa. The capacity utilization is not up to 20%. What can we do to get more paddy? If we need to get it from neighboring countries, let us import this paddy to, so, to supplement whatever I produce locally so that all these rice mills can produce more. The price of uh, rice can come down. So these are some of the initiatives that I think can help food. And of course, there's the issue of insecurity. But that is the biggest issue that we need to confront so that more farmers can go back to the farm. So whatever emergency measures we can take around those issues, I think that will give us more results than releasing grains or, or releasing fertilizer. I mean, those ones are just scratching the, the surface. But the good thing is that it's now within the scope of an emergency. Therefore, we should be able to take some emergency steps around it. Now, let's talk about this 500 billion uh, Naira now that uh, will be taking from uh, the, the, the supplementary budget uh, to, to, to provide palliatives. I'm, I'm just wondering what, what can, even though the government has not said uh, anything about the nature of the palliatives, now what, what kind of palliatives do you think the government can provide with, with this 500 billion naira that, that can actually make a difference in the lives of uh, citizens of this country? Well, uh, of course, the World Bank component of the palliatives is around cash transfers. Just as I said, I'm not so much excited about cash transfers. 
Now we have this 500 billion, whatever we can do in the area of transportation, that should be fine. We can roll out, roll out more mass transit buses at, across the country. And don't, don't forget, this is not just a federal issue. The states also have a role to play in this, uh, in this palliative uh, issue. Because all of them are likely to get better revenue from these reforms. Savings from the first subsidy, then additional revenue from the foreign exchange uh, convergence. So this, is enrich, this will enrich the, the federation account. So all of them are likely to have a lot more money now to spend. So we should also hold them to account. What exactly are they bring, bringing to the table? As far as palliatives are concerned, at the local government level, at the state level, and at the federal level. But for me, the low-hanging fruit, of course, should be transportation. Then if there's a way we can you know, support uh, better energy tariff concessions, tax concessions, so that we don't see a situation where the energy price will go beyond what it is now. If anything, we expect the energy prices to come down. And we can do that by waiving taxes, by waiving levies, by waiving charges on all the importation of petroleum products. So those concessions, of course, will also cost money. And those are the kind of things I have in mind. I mean, you, 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 you keep talking about waivers, you know, tax waivers and all of that. But, but then the government is also, <laughs> the government needs uh, revenue badly. So I'm, I'm just wondering, how does the government balance this with its, uh, you know, de desire and, and quest to raise uh, revenue, which, which of course is also a problem? You see, economic management is about human beings. Governance is also about human beings. Already from the first subsidy, we're expecting a savings of close to seven trillion. From the forex uh, unification, we are expecting additional revenue of about four trillion annually. That has created some fiscal space. All these waivers and things I'm talking about, can it cost up, can it cost up to a trillion naira? Perhaps not. So there's room to give a lot of concessions, if only even at a transitional stage. Because the shock on the citizens now is quite enormous. And when you give such concessions, the chances of trickle down is much higher. You know, in terms of the basic, basic needs that the, the citizens are consuming. Because more people will, will have the opportunities of benefiting from it. And even taxes. I mean, we can expand the threshold of people who will not be paying personal income tax. Anybody earning below 150,000 or 200,000 per, per month should not be paying personal income tax. The same thing with SMEs. So there's a mix of policies that we should put together, you know, to be able to ease the pressure on the citizens. And we need to do these things very quickly. On, 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 and you're quite right. Just before I let you go, let, let me get your take on the tax reforms now announced by uh, the, the presidency just, just recently. Uh, suspending, for instance, four taxes and uh, suspending the implementation of uh, the Finance Act as well. No, that, that, is, that is, is a good move because the, the excise tax has been suspended. The green tax has been suspended because all those things we are going to put a lot of pressure, additional pressure on manufacturers, which we don't need at this time. Already we have a regime of excise duty, which has been scheduled to run for over three years, ending in 2024. So, I mean, it is strange that the Buhari administration had to come up with additional, additional uh, review of excise duty. So it's a good thing that that was suspended. The same thing with the green tax. The green tax was going to increase the level of import duty on vehicles to almost 45%. I mean, how do you, how do you not get vehicles on the road? In an economy where over 90% of movement is by road. I mean, it's a contradiction. So that also is a welcome development. Then the Finance Act, the whole idea of the Finance Act deferment is to allow for enough room in line with the national tax policy and in line with best practice. You don't enact a law and the law is taking place immediately or taking place retroactively. That is what the deferment of the implementation of the Finance Act and some elements of the Customs and Excise Act 
Uh, that, that is what it, it, it was meant to achieve, which is in order. Well, uh, organizations like NECA have said, look, uh, you know, it's, it's that the, 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 the government should just go the whole hog, not just suspend these taxes, but ensure that they do not come back. What, what, what do you think? Well, that has to be looked at very critically because, again, just as you said, government also needs revenue. So we cannot waive everything. There are elements of it that can stay in order to you know, further the objective of fiscal consolidation. There are elements of it that we need to interrogate the government on. Uh, of course, there are issues around the Finance Act. But you know, we have to do this engagement incrementally or gradually so that we can achieve, achieve better, better results. So I, I agree with NECA. I mean, there is room for further engagement on what concessions should be given within the scope of the Finance Act. Dr. Muda Yusuf, CEO, Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. Thank you very much for joining us on the show and thank you for your insights. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Thank you very much, sir. We'll take a short break and we'll be right back. Stay with us, don't go away. Opinions are free, facts are sacred, the truth is universal. How in practical terms? Can we, for instance, de-escalate the tension? President must see himself as the president of the Federal Republic. We know where the enemy is. Three places. Um, the Lake Chad basin, the border area between Nigeria and Cameroon, and then the Sambisa forest. On Digi 360, we give you a complete dose of everything. Opinion, facts, and undiluted truths. I hardly believe what politicians say in this uh, part of the world. A new Nigeria is possible, a future is possible. We delve into the issues, dissect it so that you can understand it, use it to take action. I don't think there's any need for go any governor to look for grant for ranching. Digi360, dissecting the issues.